I'm going to be the, I'm going to try to take the, uh, the sort of anti-Robert here. And I am honestly going to talk a little bit about how uh, I'm sort of at a crossroads about drones. Uh, I have been the evangelist for drones for a long time. And now I'm kind of like, nah, they're here. Like, they're, they're fine. But I'll, I'll, go through, I'll go through a little bit of history here uh, to start this out and give you just an idea of where we have gone, where we've come from. So just to give you a little bit of background on me, I am a professor of the practice here at the College of Journalism and Mass Communications here at the Harvard of the Plains. Uh, Gary Kevill hired me and I can vividly remember um, before coming to work for him and for the college, I went to a conference in Southern California. Uh, this would have been summer of 2011 where I saw this Belgian company selling a drone that could automatically map a large area. It was a fixed wing drone, it had a camera on the bottom, and it was doing sort of early days photogrammetry work and blew my mind. Walked up to him, handed him my wallet, said, I'll take that one. They said, yeah, they're $65,000 a piece, and by the way, they're completely illegal in the United States. And I heard the $65,000 part, not the completely illegal part, got my wallet back. But I couldn't shake this idea, and I came back to the college, and a couple months later, I went to Gary, and I said, hey, drones are gonna be this huge thing in journalism. We should get on this right away. The completely illegal thing's not totally true. There's some university wiggle room that we can go through, but let's do this. And Gary says, okay. And I said, now hold on. I want you to be under I want you to understand something very clear here. I am going to hand flying lawnmowers to children. And this is your last opportunity to say no. And he did not. So I owe Gary a huge debt of gratitude for not saying no, but I want to show you sort of where we came from. The first drone we bought um, had almost no power and the camera was terrible. And this is us trying to solve that problem by putting a GoPro onto it and learning very quickly that this drone is very limited. And we had to rig up a, a, a landing strut using a binder clip. And we're going to try to take off with this camera on this drone using this $400 drone that we had. And here is the first attempt. And what you can't hear in the audio is the very loud props turning on and it's too heavy. Bonk. <laughs> this goes on. I can keep showing you how this just really does not work at all. We're using a GoPro as a landing gear here, which is a bad idea. Um, it doesn't really work. So then we made a great leap forward. We started hanging out with hobbyists. And this is what I mean by handing a flying lawnmower to children. This drone had 11 inch blades on it. And you're going to see Ben take off here. Ben has to control the thing every last move that it makes. There is no assistive technologies on this. It doesn't know where it's at. It doesn't know how to hover. It will not fly itself, unlike current drones. So could Ben have taken his face off? Very easily. Could he have taken my face off? Very easily. Did the university's insurance company know that any of this was going on? Absolutely not. <laughs> and nor would they ever. So we managed to figure out how to get a better drone in the air and we were able to do a story where Nebraska is in the midst of a, of a legendary drought, one of the worst in the state's history. And early day drones here, we were able to get out and fly over the Platte River in Nebraska. Now the joke about the Platte River, it's a mile wide and an inch deep. Uh, and it does go dry in the summertime, it does. Uh, but it was unusual how dry and how long it had been dry when we did this. Well, these 
images that you're looking at here got the attention of media all around the world. We did a ton of interviews everywhere, but it also got the attention of the Federal Aviation Administration. And after publishing this, I received a cease and desist letter from the FAA, which should you ever get the opportunity to get a cease and desist order from a federal regulatory agency, I highly recommend it. It is exhilarating. You will feel very, very alive. You will contemplate prison, but you'll be alive. Where we went from here, the FAA said, well, we don't really have rules, but there's some rules you can apply for. You just gotta fill this paperwork out and you fill it out, it doesn't take that long, and then we'll, we'll look at it and we'll approve it. Well, not that long to the FAA. It took us a year to fill out the paperwork. It took them another six months to answer, and their answer was no. They said I had to have a pilot certificate in order to be able to do this. And I said, so you've got a drone certificate, right? And they said, no. So I went and got a pilot's license. And then I got done with that, and I applied again, and they said, no. And said, why now? And they said, well, we've come up with these new rules that you don't need a pilot's license anymore. I'm like, great, fabulous. Don't regret a thing. Flying an airplane is the most fun. It is extraordinarily expensive, but man, alive is it fun. I miss it every day. As soon as I can get rid of my kids and they can be on their own accounts, I am going to go back to flying airplanes. But we go from that from that wobbly video and a lack of regulation and a lack of rules, these new rules came into effect in 2016 that allowed for commercial pilots to fly to that this is what the technology looks like right now. This is a pilot flying a FPV drone, a very small one, and just flies into a bowling alley. And I'm gonna go down the lane here and back around, and this is the one that blows my mind, is going in behind. That is a pilot with some guts, because I'd have crashed this thing 10 times over by now. And through the legs, <laughs> and in behind. Yeah, that, that could have gone poorly. But you can see this is amazing. It's flat out unbelievable. The type of camera on this thing when we started would have been the size of a small lunchbox. And now this drone is about the size of my hand that they're flying along. It's just unbelievable. The question, though, that I have, oops, you can buy this in a kit now. You can just go out and buy this. Um, DJI just put out their professional product. It's called uh, the Aveda. It's eh, about 800 bucks all in. Um, I'm going to exit out of this very quickly and just open this link. And you can see it. Because I want to put this in perspective, whatever. Put it in perspective of what Ben was flying before, and now this will, that drone, by the way, that Ben was flying cost us well more than $1,000. This is about seven, $800. It has prop guards. It has the headset that goes with it. It allows you to do things like this, follow people around as they jump off the side of mountains. You fly it with a control stick and you can see the technology has changed unbelievably. But to continue a thread here, a question might be, is this legal? And the answer is no, they're not. Not under current FAA regulation. Now, 
the guy who flew into the bowling alley can make the argument that as soon as he crossed the threshold of the door, he's indoors where the FAA doesn't have jurisdiction. And he's technically correct. But there have been other FPV videos that I was going to pull up here, um, or I could pull up here, that start outside of a football stadium or a basketball stadium and go inside and then go out the other door. Current regulations say the drone has to be within the line of sight of the operator at all times. And if you've got a VR headset on, you're not looking at it. Now you can use a spotter, but is that spotter able to see it at all times? Not if they're flying into a building. So, go forward, you thing. So this brings up what's next. There are some rule changes on the horizon that are gonna open up a few things that journalists in particular, but drone enthusiasts have wanted to do for some time that have not been allowed up to now, but we are still years away. So then the before times, as I said before, there were no rules. The FAA had a bunch of memos and sort of documents stitched together that they were calling a regulatory scheme, but that really wasn't. They hadn't gone through the process. It wasn't in 2016 that they did. They enacted part 107. I teach a class every year now called How to Get Your Drone License. It does what it says on the tin. It's a one credit hour class. I'll give you all the materials you need. I'll teach you all the hard stuff. And at, when, at the end of it, you'll know enough to go pass the FAA's knowledge exam. And I have students who go out and do that. And I have students who've gotten jobs because on their resume it says they are a Part 107 licensed drone pilot. And they get attention that way. An employer looks at that and goes, oh, wow. Part 107 currently says you cannot fly over people. I am certain that all of you have seen drone videos flying over protests or sporting events or concerts or things like that. Absolutely legal, absolutely irresponsible. Again, you're talking about a flying lawnmower over people. If the battery shorts, if a prop fails, if a motor goes out, a motor that you do not know what the engine time is on there, and none of the manufacturers had said, here's how long you can expect your motors to last. That thing gives out. If you're flying a bigger one, if you're flying one of the Inspire models that have 12 inch blades and are six pounds, six pounds at terminal velocity is fatal. You can kill someone. So the FAA says, don't do that. Do people do it? All the time. Can't fly out of line of sight. I'll tell you what, my age now, age 47, line of sight isn't what it used to be. You fly down range. I did a, a, a video with a group of students where we were just, they were doing a big story about harvest around here. And it was, um, there were some issues going on around the harvest and so we needed some, some shots of harvest. So if you've never seen a harvest here in the Midwest, it's visually stunning because it's just this massive equipment going these long rows in this golden field and you get this, if you do it at the right time of day, the light is just amazing and the scale of it is just massive. And if you just get up in the air about 40 feet with a nice wide angle lens, you begin to realize how truly gargantuan our agriculture is in the, in the United States. So I'm tracking these combines as they're going down, these harvesters as they're going down these rows and I'm following them as they go along and I'm looking at my video and I'm adjusting my settings and I'm doing all this and I look up to look for it and I'm more than a half a mile down range and I can't see it. And so I'm, up in the air and I'm coming back because uh, I'm going to know where it is, theoretically, until I can get into my line of sight. I'm like, oh, there it is. Okay. But it's tiny. It's a little tiny spot on the horizon. And that's the limitation of the distance you can fly. Will the radios on board this thing fly much further? Absolutely. You can fly several miles downrange. Could you see it? Absolutely not. That has always been the death knell of any company that wants to deliver products via drone. Amazon Air was never going to fly as long as beyond line of sight operations was never allowed. Amazon Air was never going to fly as long as the FAA said, one pilot, one drone. That's it. And no autopilot. 
So not flying over people, not flying um, beyond your line of sight, and then subtly not at night. Here in the great Midwest, we are reaching a period of time when night lasts from about 2.30 in the afternoon till 4.30, I mean, like, it starts at 2.30 in the afternoon, it feels like. It's, it's like it gets dark early. We're at a point where six months of the year, it is gonna be dark a lot. So not being able to fly at night limits the amount of time that you can actually fly this thing. And for a lot of journalism, that might go on in the dark. And not being able to fly at night was a thing. Well, flight at night was the first thing that got fixed. It didn't take that long. You can fly at night, as long as you have a little bit of extra lighting on there. If you have strobes on there that just announce to other airplanes that there's something here, you can buy them off Amazon now. You just stick them to the top of your drone, off you go. Flight over people, however, is coming. It's not quite here yet, although FAA regulations are in place to do this. The basic breakdown of the regulations for flight over people is, depending on what you got and what you wanna do, you need a drone that will limit the possibility of you really hurting somebody if it goes wrong. It's really the way to look at it. They break them down by categories. So category one. Category one is gonna be the one that most of us get in under. Category one, the drone has to weigh less than 0.55 pounds, a little, little more than half a pound. All in, camera, assistive devices, prop guards, whole nine, all in 0.55 pounds, takeoff weight. It has remote ID capabilities. The FAA is working on sort of implementing remote ID capabilities so that anybody can know what that, who that drone is. Every airplane in the sky right now has something called ADS-B, which is just constantly broadcasting speed, altitude, location, and tail number. So everybody knows, so anytime you see those teams that are tracking Elon Musk's plane or whoever's plane, they're using ADS-B. It's all open, it's all out there. You need a little radio transponder to, or a little radio receiver to receive ADS-B. There are people that this is their hobby they have, a, they have an antenna at their house, they receive ADS-B, they put it on internet, so flight aware and things like that are just pulling data from hobbyists. They're pulling in all this ADS-B stuff. Drones don't have that. They will, soon. So a category one, it's light, it can be remotely identified, it has no exposed spinning blades. So those blades have gotta be caged. We used to make fun of people who use blade cages, we called them training wheels. If you couldn't control your drone enough to keep it away from something and chop something with your blades, then you were a terrible pilot. Now it's part of it. So if you can think of something that is 0.55 pounds and doesn't have anything exposed that can cut you falling out of the air, what's gonna happen? It's gonna hit you and you're gonna go, what was that? It's not gonna hurt. That's the important thing. As technology has gotten smaller and lighter and stronger and all of that, this is now become possible. There are some drones on the market that are 0.55 pounds that have unbelievable 4K cameras on board. Don't have prop guards, not yet. Don't have remote ID, but we are close. We're very close to having marketable products that can get this done. So that's the one that most of us are gonna end up using if you wanna fly over people. And if you can meet these criteria, Concerts, football games, protests, whatever you want to do, go ahead and fly it over them. Nothing's stopping you from doing it because you're not going to hurt anybody if it goes wrong. Now, speaking of the greater Midwest, a breeze around here means something different than it does in other parts of the country. A breeze around here requires you to stand somewhat sideways and brace yourself. How do you think a 0.55 pound drone is gonna handle you know, a normal 15 mile an hour wind on a, on a casual Tuesday in Nebraska? Eh, it's gonna to need to be powerful. So there's gonna be some limits here, but the major one is you can fly over people. Then there's category two. It can be more than 0.55 pounds, but this is where the FAA becomes the FAA. This is where they earn their money. The regulation is it 
will not cause an injury to a human being that is equivalent or greater than the severity of injury caused by a transfer of 11 foot pounds of kinetic energy upon impact from a rigid, rigid object. I'm sure we all know what that means. I don't need to explain that. We can move along. Here's the problem. Nobody really knows what that means. There are engineers all over the place right now that are throwing materials at bodies with sensors on them to figure out what is the actual kinetic transfer of 11 foot pounds of kinetic energy and, energy and what kind of, what kind of accident can that cause. The FAA is going to demand substantial documentation on this. These drones to be able to demonstrate, by the way, the FAA hasn't figured out how you're going to make substantial demonstration of that yet. So the FAA is demanding documentation but won't tell you what that documentation is. And so this is likely years away. So no exposed blades, meets this transfer capability, and has no safety defects. If that's the case, you can fly over people. What's likely to happen here, the FAA for a long time got really obsessed with a word that I had never heard before, which was frangible. And what frangible means is basically it would break apart on impact. They essentially wanted drone manufacturers to make a drone frame made of spray foam. And so when it hit people, it would just break apart and it wouldn't hurt them. So a lot of the effort in this area is going to be materials based. So that if it hits you, it just kind of bends or it may break apart. There are some drones that are built so that they are held together by magnets. So the components break apart. They literally will fall apart and you just sort of magnet the thing back together again. Nothing in this area remotely close yet, but it is another option. You'll see these in the, in the next few years. Category three, we now raise the energy transfer to 25 pounds. These cannot fly over people just a regular old crowd. I can't go to Memorial Stadium on a game day and just fly this thing around. What it does allow is if it's enclosed, it's a secure location and people are notified that a drone could fly over them, then it could work. We're talking about Hollywood here. Hollywood has really good lobbyists and they are well within the ears of the FAA. And so there is always a carve out here for Hollywood. So when they wanna put one of those you know, un bajillion dollar black magic cameras on a drone and fly it over the head of, you know, some unbelievably wealthy celebrity. This is how they're going to do it. So this is, <laughs> this is one of those, if you have to ask how much it costs, you can't afford it things. None of us are going to be flying under this unless you do go to Hollywood, which good on you, man. Give me a call. You can, Sponsor a classroom or something, because you're probably doing pretty well for yourself. Cat 4 requires a drone to go through the FAA's airworthiness certificate process. When Cessna builds a new model of airplane, it has to go through the airworthiness certificate process. That process takes six years. I want you to look at your iPhone and imagine the iPhone you had six years ago. Would you be happy finally getting that iPhone today? This is going to be a very, very, very narrow path. This is going to be police drones. This is going to be uh, emergency services stuff. This is going to be repurposed military hardware is where this is going to be, but there is a path for it. Uh, and again, years until this is going to do anything at all. So the question that I have for you, we will very soon be able to fly over people. And there is obvious journalism to be done in that. We have gone through a period of time in American history where protests are suddenly a very big deal again. And God forbid they will be again. But do our audiences, do the people that we would be covering want drones flying over their heads? 
I can tell you what, I've had a number of drones fly over my head. I have flown my own drone uncomfortably close to my head. Unadvisedly, don't do that. I'm down in the hay market one night. Me and my son went and got some dinner. This is years ago now, and we're walking back, and I hear this noise, and it is a drone. And there is a guy flying his drone at windshield height down the street and basically just skimming the top of cars and being a jackass is what he was being. And then he flew right over towards my son and I, and I started looking for the guy. And I started looking for the guy to have a very free and frank discussion about the next few moments of his life and how he wanted to spend them, because I was mad. Do we want to engage our audiences that way? I don't think so. I think there is an ethical conversation that needs to go on where if you're terrifying people with the equipment that you're using, maybe that's not a good use of that equipment. We're gonna have to come up with internal rules and ethical guidelines about how and when we're gonna do this and how do we keep it so we're not actually bothering people. There's absolutely a reason we should fly over a protest. There is no reason that we should fly a foot over a protest. The better shot is 50, 60, 70, 80 feet above it where they may not even notice. And frankly, that's the better way to go about it. A lot of these FPV drone videos that I have seen where people are flying, they're very obviously staged. The guy who had the drone go through his legs like this was told where to stand. There was a tape mark on the floor and it said, you best be standing here at beat 15 because this thing is gonna go through your legs. And if you don't want your knees to be chopped off, be there. And could you do that with just a regular bowling league night? Absolutely not. You would cause chaos. You would hurt people. So while we, um, this, is, this is the ethical question that I always ask my students when we start talking about journalism ethics, be it in the beginning reporting class all the way through to the senior ethics class. Because we can, should we? And one of the first rules that I talked about in the drone lab was anytime we ask a question, an answer must be no, we should not do this. This was a terrible idea and we should stop immediately. Just because we can take a drone and do something doesn't mean that we should. The FAA is going to make it legal. Is it responsible? And, and a lot of these cases, of these things that you're seeing, which generally speaking are not journalists doing them, I would say no. I have students asking me all the time, when are we gonna get an FPV drone? And I'm like, A, probably never, and B, when the university's insurance company says we can do that, which by the way, is never. They're not gonna allow that. They're just not. It's gonna be 10 plus years by the time that happens. And this place will probably have fired me by then. The next thing beyond flying over people is beyond line of sight operations. Under the current rules, can't be without your line of sight. You can use an observer, but you have to be able to speak to each other via voice. So I coached youth soccer. I can cast my voice a good long ways and you will hear it because if you've ever had to yell at a U7 soccer team, you learn how to work your lungs up. But that's just it. You can't have a radio. You can't just be talking on a headset. You can't be FaceTiming each other. You have to be within voice range of each other to be able to do this. If the observer can see it and the pilot can't, that's fine. You're, you're still legal. So in instances of those FPV drones, um, one I, actually I'm thinking about this, I have this one. So I'm gonna ask you, I want you to watch this video next, answer the question, is this legal from that FPV point of view? Here's the Target Center in Minneapolis. Gonna go under a garage door into a publicity shoot. Let's go into the arena.
lights, a stage, a bit of a shoot around. Come up here. Obviously, it's a little brighter on my screen than this one, but you get the idea. Now we're going to approach a very expensive NBA player. And we're going to come right back out the garage again and into downtown Minneapolis. Are we certain that we haven't flown over anybody's head outdoors? Are we confident that that pilot kept it within their line of sight the entire time, even though if you look at the video, you can't see them anywhere? Is it legal? Well, the Minnesota Timberwolves were pretty proud to put this out wherever they could. Has the pilot been fined by the FAA? No. Have they gotten a stern word from the FAA? I don't know. I highly doubt it. These things are being public, published all the time. Um, university athletic departments are starting to do this stuff. I found a couple from like Fresno State. What's up? Can they do BLOS? Uh, I don't think, I, have not, I haven't seen anything like that, but I've seen plenty of flying with people who are inspired. Ooh. And I would love to see that waiver. So to get the, so, to, to understand what we're talking about here, and those of you who are on Zoom, he's asking about waivers. Uh, the FAA does grant waivers to some of these, um, some of these restrictions. The Flight over people waiver, I believe there's only two of them. And I think CNN has them both. And the first was a tethered drone that they had, but the FAA wouldn't let them fly it above nine or above 10 feet in the air. And CNN wouldn't fly it below nine feet because they felt it was too close to anybody. So they could use that drone and fly it over people, but they could only keep it in a one foot segment. They never did use that. The other one was for a drone that was actually held together by magnets, and it was so small that they could only use it in very limited capacities. I would be shocked if your university had a flight over people restriction. Now, that's not to say that people haven't done very creative things where they like mark off a sidewalk and they fly straight down the sidewalk and they have people walking on both sides of the sidewalk but they can technically say, we didn't fly over anybody's head because we kept this one lane clear. It is technical compliance, but not actual compliance. So this pilot is absolutely gonna make the argument of, I could see it outside, and when it went inside, it's not under FAA jurisdiction, and that's fine. Um, but beyond line of sight operations is gonna open up a fair number of things. So to do this, there is currently a rulemaking committee that earlier this year put forward recommendations to the FAA. The FAA is currently considering them and they're gonna go through the rulemaking process. This sounds as exciting as it is. Federal rulemaking is woo, it is absolutely scintillating. But we're talking about probably another year and a half or so before we see any of this stuff. The FAA, to make beyond line of sight operations work, according to the working group that made these recommendations, the FAA is going to have to allow automated see and avoid technologies. Currently, the FAA allows no such thing. Your drone, some of them have sensors on board that know there's a tree or an obstacle in front of it and will stop themselves. FAA says, that's all fine and good. It doesn't actually do anything under the law. So what they're saying is the drone is going to have to know when, it's in, when it itself is in trouble and be able to automatically avoid impacts with anything. And the FAA is going to have to allow it. In order to do that, the FAA is going to have to have regulations on what qualifies as see and avoid. And that could take years by itself. They're talking about adding a beyond line of sight 
element to the test, either part of the actual license or some kind of add-on. So if you're a pilot of, of, of manned aviation, um, there are levels. So for instance, my license was a sport light license, which meant I could fly an airplane that could only be about 1,300 pounds and have a 100 horsepower motor in it. I was flying a lawnmower around, two-seater. If, uh, if my flight instructor had been like a defensive tackle, we would have had to have drained gas out of it in order to get under the 1,300-pound takeoff weight. I'm not kidding. It was a tiny airplane. Your next step up is a private pilot. Your next step up is an instrument rating. Your next step up after that is a commercial license. And there's more beyond that. You can keep adding to your license. They're talking about starting to do that with the drone license. So pilots would have to be certified to be able to fly beyond line of sight. They'd have to be certified to be able to fly more than one aircraft at one time. But in order to, if, if the FAA actually does allow this, now Amazon Prime Air is on the menu because one pilot can control multiple drones at once. They can be semi-responsible for their own see and avoid problems. They can see other aircraft. They can see trees. They can see whatever and get out of the way. Talking years for this stuff. Years. I would expect there to be additional waivers for beyond line of sight operations that would allow limited capacities. Um, for instance, flying below 400 feet and within 100 feet of a building. That would create a shield that would keep any other aircraft away from that. And you wouldn't have any problems, if you couldn't see it, running into another airplane. But most of this stuff is years away. And what does that enable? What does beyond line of sight operations enable? It would enable a newsroom, a well-financed newsroom, to have a drone sitting on the deck up top. And when a call to a fire or a murder or whatever went out, they could have the drone go out there, fly over it, start getting video of it before anybody even got there. It would replace the news helicopter. Suddenly you could base drones all around the city. You could have one pilot centrally located and when news was happening, you can just send them from your little drone bases around. One of the most common features of morning television in any city in America is the traffic report. You could actually automate just having a drone take off, stare down the interstate, get that, get that live shot of traffic, set right back down. You have one controller doing it. The, you know, the KTLA news traffic helicopter out there, those things are $3,000 an hour in the air. They're a multi-million dollar aircraft just to buy. We're not talking about fuel. We're not talking about employing pilots. We're not talking about insurance. We're not talking about anything. A $600 drone could do the same thing better, but not without the rules. So. It opens up some doors. I have been talking for years about this idea of sort of autonomous drones running around the city, gathering video for news all the time. It's been possible for a while. It's just the law is not there. And unfortunately, our journalism institutions are not exactly flush with cash right now to start just buying scores of drones and hiring drone teams. Um, other areas that this can unlock, I, I've experimented for years with building, um, using photogrammetry to build three dimension models of buildings and putting those in virtual experiences where you can just walk around them and look at them. I've sort of stopped because folks like Robert are doing a really great job with the stuff that they're doing, but sort of large scale landscape VR, there's just not a lot in the way of audience for that. There's not a lot in the way of opportunity for that. And there's other things that we could be doing uh, that are of more immediate use to students. I realize Robert's gonna jump me the next time I see him and punch me about the head and face because I'm letting a little bit of the, of the darkness creep in, but I'm a Gen Xer, that's kind of what we do. So um, with that, that's the, that's the near-term future. 
I appreciate you uh, listening. If you've got any questions for me, I'm happy to answer them here. If you have something that really burning you up and you remember it on the way home, that's my email address. That's my Twitter handle. Twitter is my heroin addiction. I'm still just chasing the high from 2008, and I can't get off of it. I wish I could. So I'm there all the time. Any questions? I generally tell people, depending on the kind of student you are and depending on your sort of general level of ADHD, it can be anywhere from about 20 to 40 hours of studying. Um, what I tell students is it's not hard, it's just work. You have to commit to just learning a, a sort of an overlaying series of pieces of knowledge and the FAA test is going to ask you a question, but it's going to pull from about two or three different areas of knowledge and work them together, and you've got to figure out how that works together. And if you don't know it, you don't know it. I have so many students that hear, oh, yeah, you can get an FAA drone license if you take a 60-question multiple-choice test, and they're like, no problem. I can do that in my sleep. I'm like, yeah, you can't bullshit your way through this one. I'm like, you got to know it. Um, a passing score is a 70%. The joke in flight school that they told me that I wish was not a joke is what do you call somebody who gets a 70% on their knowledge exam? You call them a pilot. It doesn't matter. 70 or not, it's a pass-fail test. So I have a series of uh, classes that we go through. We go over the hard stuff. I have some online materials that I give to students that they can go over themselves. There's a book that the FAA has called the Pilot uh, Pilot Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, that's free. You can just go get it. Um, I have a literal drawer in my office just filled with them and I just give them to students. Um, and then there's an app uh, on the iPhone called Prepware Remote Pilot that is 10 bucks, I wanna say, but it's worth its weight in gold because it has a enormous test bank of questions and it will randomly generate FAA, very, very similar to FAA knowledge tests, randomly. And if you can just sit there and take those and get 90 plus percent, you'll breeze through the test, no problem. And so that's the last step that I always tell people to do is just get that prepware remote pilot and just start banging out practice tests. Study the things you miss. Don't worry about the things you got right because that's the runway behind you. It's just utterly useless to you. So just study the things you miss and I've had one student out of the 800 or so that I've had in these classes, be they professional or students here, had one that didn't pass it on the first try. And that's because she doubted herself, went back and changed six questions and missed it by one. <laughs> Took it the second time, I said, trust your first answer, she got a 94. So, yeah. Yeah, what's up? So we got my uh, license finally a years ago. Nice! Congratulations. Uh, I was a drone journalism school in uh, Syracuse, as you came in. Uh, so now I get, have to be certified. Yes. I heard from some people that, oh, it's a lot easier, but I don't trust that. The test was hard. Yes, the test is hard, and they don't make it kind on you. Um, students will know the horror of the test center where you go and you have to take a test and it's monitored and it feels like prison. The FAA test is very similar. They put you in a closet, you've got a computer, it's very stressful. But um, recertifying now has changed where you just have to basically sit through an FAA webinar and then take an exam after, actually I don't even think you have to take the exam after it. You just have to sit through the webinar and go over the materials. I think there's a couple of quizzes you gotta take and then it's done. You don't have to pay the 150 bucks. You don't have to actually pass anything anymore. You have decided to recertify at precisely the right time. So I got my license. Immediately after the rules came in place, I was the second person in Lincoln, Nebraska to go to the, uh, the Flight Standards District office here and ask for it, and they still had no idea what we were talking about. Um, but I got my license right away, immediately started teaching other people how to get it. I had to renew, the old renewal was you had to retake the test. Pay 150 bucks, retake the test. 
it's easier the second time just because you know more than you knew before. You do have to refresh yourself. But now the FAA has done away with that. They got tired of people complaining about having to pay 150 bucks every two years because regular pilots don't have to do that. And so now you just have to sit through a free webinar on their website, go through there, and then it says, yep, you're recertified, you have gone through this. The webinar hammers on airspace. The FAA is sick and tired of idiot pilots flying too close to airports. Uh, it will really, really hammer on that. It'll hammer, under a few, it'll hammer over a few of the new regulations like this flight over people stuff. Uh, which is part D of part 107. Um, but otherwise, it's relatively simple. It's, a, it's an investment of, a, of an hour of a day, and you're done. Yep, yeah, go ahead. Uh, what kind of jobs are your students doing? Um, they are getting jobs. Um, there are a number of students who have very short traditional producer jobs at local television news stations here in town. There's a station out in western Nebraska that advertises their drone. It's sponsored by a local company. Um, I've had students get jobs as photographers at news organizations around the country. I've also had them get jobs as videographers for companies. Um, a number have gotten jobs as uh, like photo video uh, folks for like large hospital systems that are doing promotional videos for things like that. Uh, I've got an email in my inbox uh, from a student who is shooting a video for the local newspaper, um, same thing. Um, PR, uh, there's a guy here on campus who got his license um, and does video for the university. If you ever see any promotional video of this institution and there's this sort of panning shot of the cupola over Love Library, he shot it. Um, there's a company here in town called Huddle that does, it's a startup that does uh, a lot of like sports highlights and uh, recruiting and things like that. A couple of students have gone over there, gotten jobs just because that made them stand out. What else? Yeah, I mean, it, and, and you know, we've been doing this since 2016 and, and, and the pandemic has screwed my brain up so I'm not even remembering half of them. Um, but yeah, there's anywhere a company wants video done. Uh, I've had a student in a, in a previous class who started a precision ag company out in western Nebraska and flies over farm fields and does um, near field infrared work on fields and tells them where they need to water and where they need to fertilize and all of that. Um, so there's a lot of ag companies that are starting to do it around here now. Um, yeah, it's... There's a, anywhere that somebody wants to do any sort of video work, uh, aerial photography, promotion, anything like that, that's, that's where those opportunities are. Um, most sports franchises now have somebody who's certified who work for them for all kinds of promotional stuff. The athletic department here on campus has their own drone pilots and they do not let anyone else fly around their stadium. In fact, they have alerted the police every time there's somebody over there and the university police discover civil asset forfeiture laws every time some drone pilot wants to fly all around Memorial Stadium. Go ahead. Uh, considering how fast and how much data you can transfer like through 5G connections, uh, I presume that when rules change so you don't need to fly on site, So the question for those online uh, is with 5G technologies, any amount of data you can transfer, will the FAA just do away with the rules for our beyond line of sight when you, can, when you can use 5G to just connect to it and you would know what's going on? I don't think so. And the reason is this, the FAA still views the world through a lens of pilot in airplane flying with people on board. And so forever, the FAA is very concerned about when things go wrong, rightfully, because when they go wrong in a plane with people in it, people die. Um, honestly, the one thing that I learned the most when learning how to fly airplanes was, you're gonna die, get over it, it's time to look at the checklist and figure out how to not die. 
And um, my instructor was very sort of macabre about it. Like, you need to radio, you know, she would tell you what the procedure was when your engine goes out. She's like, first you need to fly the airplane, you need to pitch for best glide. Then you need to call and tell air traffic control where to pick your body up from. And it's like, this is dark. I don't know if I know that, I don't wanna do this. So in, a, so in an airplane, the reason I'm saying this is in an airplane, you know, we have GPS. Why do you need to learn how to navigate? Well, they go out. Uh, the government turns off GPS signals from time to time to recalibrate them. Uh, sunspots cause interference, all kinds of things. So most airplanes still have old radio, or radio navigation systems, VOR systems in them. The FAA still spends a ton of money to maintain these radio towers that were the navigation systems in the 1940s. They're still around. I had to navigate through a paper map with a stopwatch during my flight training because the FAA wanted me to know to be able to navigate using timing, distance on a map, and landmarks. That if I lost it all, I'd still be okay. So the FAA is going to be extraordinarily slow at surrendering over to a technology, complete control of an, of a, of an aircraft system because Things go wrong with invisible signals in the air, even 5G. I mean, current 5G is trash. Uh, you know, in the future, it's gonna be unbelievably ubiquitous Wi-Fi everywhere, but we're still gonna find little notches in places where it doesn't work right, or it's slow, or there's a thunderstorm and something weird happens, or the power goes out, or something like that. If you're relying on something that could fail, the FAA wants a backup. And if that thing can fail, there better be a backup to that. So to give you an example, the FAA does not allow unleaded gasoline in airplanes. It does not allow carbureted engines in airplanes. The motors that are in airplanes right now, your sort of general aviation motors, like your grandparents would look at them. Your, if your grandfather worked on cars in that era, they'd look at this motor and go, I get this. I totally understand this. They don't move quickly at all when it comes to these mechanical systems that can fail. If it works and it works reliably, they're gonna lean on that forever. So I'm gonna tell you right now that we will have self-driving cars navigating using 5G long before we have fleets of drones in the sky using 5G to get around there because the FAA is just going to move slower than everybody else. They always have, they always will. Yeah. Uh, on, on that uh, topic, drone so-called fireworks shows. Yes. I Yep. Um, and I'm wondering, assuming there were cameras on such, I mean, so the FAA is obviously allowing this. Yes. In certain areas. Like, could, like, what are your thoughts on how arrays of drones with cameras and or sensors could be used for just media in general? <sighs> yet, but, and, and then on top of that, like, what would be necessary, like, would they give us permission to do that? Could we get a license? I'll add, so the, the question for those online is, uh, you have these drone firework shows where you have these arrays of drones that have cameras and sensors on them that are coordinating themselves and it's all coordinated through computers and things like that. The waiver that they're basically flying under is that they're doing it in a closed location. So it's, it's almost identical to a firework show where the firework show is not going off in the middle of town, it's going on on the far side of a lake uh, and everybody is gathered on the opposite side of the lake and that's where that stuff goes off. Could we get the license to do that? Absolutely we could. The question is, could we do anything useful within the restrictions of that? If there was a case where there was a newsworthy place that we would want to fly around and, and just do unimaginably detailed photogrammetry on. But we could close it off and make sure that nobody was in there. I think you could pull it off. But 
if you're talking about like the World Cup, absolutely. I mean, well, the Qatari government can do whatever it wants. The World, the, the World Cup 2026 here in the United States. Um, quick story: I was in Dubai uh, speaking at the uh, the Arab Media Forum in, in Dubai, and it was gorgeous. It was an absolutely wonderful trip. And I was asking the conference organizers, I said, I looked up drone laws here in the United Arab Emirates and there's not a lot on paper. And they're like, yeah. And I said, can I fly my drone out here? And they're like, yeah, absolutely. I'm like, am I not gonna get in trouble? And they're like, are you gonna fly over anybody important? I'm like, no. Are you gonna fly anywhere really sensitive? I'm like, I'm flying on the beach outside of my hotel. And they're like, go ahead. And it's like, you gotta understand here in the Emirates, everything is fine until it's not. And I went, okay, and then I walked away and I went, wait, hold on, that's terrifying. So I am certain there will be a ton of drone stuff around the World Cup in Qatar. I highly doubt any of it would be very legal in the United States just because they're on the world stage and rules are gonna get bent. Could we do that here in the United States in 2026? I really, really, really doubt it. Are there gonna be drone light shows at that World Cup? Absolutely but they're gonna live within a very confined space. Remember the drone light show at the Super Bowl a couple, three, four years ago? They filmed that two days ahead of time. And they shut the airspace down, filmed it, brought everybody down, turned it back on, and then just digitally edited it into the Super Bowl show afterwards. If you were there that night, you didn't see it. That's the kind of stuff we're talking about, and that's gonna go on forever because that's just the, the way the FAA is. So. We out of time. We are, as a matter of fact. Man. Okay. Thank you, Matt. This is fantastic. I know you have to be somewhere. I do. Probably in a minute. Oh my God. <laughs> so a minute ago. I'm just sort of watching your time here. <laughs>